So today we begin a new series called Soul Investment. And uh, it's a two-part series. We talk about money twice a year. We talk about it right here in the month of November as we are going into um, Thanksgiving. And uh, we talk about it in late spring going into summer. Um, And so I like the fact that we are starting this on the week of Thanksgiving and uh, Thanksgiving or gratitude, gratitude and generosity, they go hand in hand, don't they? Generosity and gratitude. And um, just as we sang this morning the song, uh, Thank You for Loving Me, uh, we thank God for his love for us. Um, the other night we were at our, our uh, small group meeting and Ray, um, our bass player, where, where is Ray? Ray sneak out? Okay, so Ray is not in here for this, but uh, the other night we were at our small group and there was a room full of people and we were about 10 feet apart and everybody was talking and Ray said to me, he said, he, he, we caught each other's eye and, and he said, thank you for loving me. And I said, uh, say again? And uh, he said, thank you for loving me. And I heard him that time, and I, this is very uncharacteristic for a conversation between Ray and me, that one of us would say to the other one, thank you for loving me. It was very uncharacteristic. And I, and I was about to say, um, okay, <laughs> no problem. Uh, don't mention it. Um, and then he said, the song, the song, thank you for loving me. He said, it would be perfect for this week. And I said, yes, yes. So I slipped the song in there this morning, the song we used to do a long time ago, uh, Tommy Walker's song, thank you for loving me. But we love God, not because we love him, but because he first loved us. And, um, and so we're, we're going into this week uh, with, with generosity in our heart and gratitude in our hearts. I love our graphic because you see all these other arrows that are going down. This one is going up and up and to the right. And one of the most fascinating things to me, most amazing things to me about Christianity is that you can, you can have a literal financial transaction that will pay you dividends for eternity. That is amazing to me. That you can, you can actually have a financial transaction. You can actually give literal money to God and for his kingdom and for his purpose, and it will pay you dividends for eternity. Because Christianity seems like such a spiritual thing, right? It seems like such a spiritual thing. And you wouldn't think of that as being part of Christianity, but it absolutely is. Uh, Years ago, I had cable. I haven't had cable now for uh, several years, but um, I used to flip around the cable channels. Maybe some of you still have cable, and you flip around the channels, and maybe you flip across some of these Christian channels. And I used to hate landing on one of those Christian channels when they were doing like a telethon, you know, or one of those things where they're raising money, because they always acted like, you know, if you give God so much, then he will give you so much. If you give some money to God, God is going to bless you and, and give you back the same amount of money. And I just thought that was so terrible, just such a terrible theology. And, and I, I just, I thought it's people like that that give Christianity a bad name. But when you read, when you actually read the New Testament, it's amazing how many scriptures there are and what God says about giving. The New Testament writers are not bashful at all about talking about the rewards of giving. If you give to God, God will give back to you. If you give to God, he will give you 
a reward for eternity. And it's not just money that we give him, but we give him our time and we give him our efforts and we give him our energy. We, in the Old Testament, uh, there's a principle called the tithe, which literally means 10% or one-tenth. And in the New Testament, uh, that, that same principle carries over into the New Testament. But as with everything, Jesus raises the bar uh, and if you remember the Sermon on the Mount, all of these things that Jesus said, well, you have heard, do this. But I tell you, it, you should do this. Or you have heard it said things like, don't commit adultery. But I tell you, if you've even looked at your neighbor's wife to lust after, you already committed adultery in your heart. So Jesus raised the bar. And I believe that the tithe is a good starting place. But in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, we are not just 10% people. We are 100% people. God doesn't just own 10% of what we have or what we make, but he owns everything that we are and everything that we have. It all belongs to him in the New Covenant. It's a beautiful concept. Uh, some people have no problem at all with giving, and some people uh, it comes more difficult for. Giving is not so easy. Um, this is a very common thing. When Lene and I were first married, uh, I was very much surprised to hear that Lene wanted to you know, keep our money. She wanted to do the bills, and she wanted to be the one who handled the money in the, in the household. Um, she was very young. I am seven years older than her, so I'd been out on my own for a while. But she moved directly from her parents' home into my home. And, and so she was inexperienced, and she said, I want to handle the money. And I was skeptical at first, but she did such a great job. A great job. She never asked me any questions. Uh, there, was never, uh, there were never any problems. The checkbook was always balanced. The bills were always paid. And, and this went on for about six months. And then one day I asked her if, um, if I could take a look at the checkbook. And in our conversation about money, we had decided and agreed that we would give, we would start with a tie. That was a good thing. To, that was a good place to start. It's a good thing to do. And so uh, we had made that decision, and um, that was what I was uh, counting on that, that we were doing. But when I looked at the checkbook, I noticed two things. Number one, we were not tithing. We weren't giving anything. That was the first thing. And the second thing was that the handwriting in our checkbook was not my wife's handwriting. It was my mother-in-law's handwriting. It was my mother-in-law's handwriting. But my first thought was I was mortified that my mother-in-law knew all of our financial business. And I said, Lene, what is going on here? And she said, well, my mom is just, she's just helping. She's just helping. And, and so uh, we had another talk after that. And she agreed, yes, we will give. And she will be the one to keep the checkbook. Um, it's just harder for some people than it is for others. And, uh, and Lene is one of those that it, it came a little more difficult for her than for other people, some, some other people. Um, I want to say this before we get into this whole subject of money today, that I am not thinking that this message is, is for the sole purpose of correction. So the sole purpose of this message is not correction. Uh, we are a very generous congregation. We are a very generous church. Um, you guys are, are just by nature just very generous people. And so that's not the purpose of this message. But if you happen to be uh, someone who does need a course correction on your giving, great. 
Because we are, that's what we do as Christians. We are constantly correcting our course. If we don't correct our course, and let me just say that the, the world and the enemy in the world is constantly tugging at us to pull us off course. Almost everything that happens to us in life is an opportunity for us to be pulled off course. You have a conversation with someone that doesn't go well. You, you, you have something that happens that is unexpected, something that stresses you. You have things that happen in your life. It's an opportunity. Almost everything is an opportunity for us to be pulled off course. So as Christians, we don't just... Uh, tolerate course correction we ask for course correction we come to church on Sunday partly for a course correction and we spend our lives constantly asking God help me to to stay on the right track to get on the right track to to be led by your Holy Spirit in the right way and so we spend our lives correcting our course so if this is a correction for uh, any of you here or any of you watching online, then great. I, I'm glad of that. And, and let me just say that, that Lene and I need course correction on money as much as anyone. Um, the title of today's message is this, Invest in Your Soul. I had a different message uh, I was going to talk about this, but I was going to talk about a couple other things. But as I went through the, the scriptures in the New Testament, and actually Old Testament scriptures as well, I was reminded of the astounding promises that God makes for those who give. And, and it's mostly, mostly, it's surprising, but it's mostly about your own heart, your own soul. It really is. Um, it just is. Read all the scriptures. There are probably hundreds in the Bible uh, that talk about giving in some way. So this message today is about investing in your soul. And let's just go, let's just get into it and let's go through some of these scriptures that, uh, that we find about giving. First thing is it's the first thing. That's the first thing. There is this principle uh, that you see in the Old Testament quite a bit. I think there are over 30 scriptures in the Old Testament that talk about this one thing, first fruits. You ever heard that? Ever heard that? First fruits. It's the first and the best. Give God the first and the best. There are a couple of scriptures I want to share with you about that, although I could go on with this. I'm just going to share a couple. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. In other words, give him your first and your best. Give him your first and your best. This is Old Testament. This is out of Proverbs 3. And then God proves to us that this is his principle because he gave us his first fruits, and this is out of 1 Corinthians, New Testament, that Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, the first one back from the dead, the first one with eternal life, okay? It was God's first and his best. First, because there was no one before Christ. Jesus said before Abraham was, I am, the great I am, he is before all. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelled among us. That's Jesus. He was the first, and He was the best. So this is absolutely a principle of God, and we should understand that what God wants from us is the first and the best. And it's easier to give the first and the best. It's easier. Uh, I read a quote this week. Um, someone said, if you wait until the payment is due, you pay twice. If you wait until the payment is due, you pay twice. Or if you wait until it's past due, 
you pay twice. It's twice as hard to give when it's all you've got left, right? It's twice as hard to give at the end as it is at the beginning. If you go ahead and get it out of the way at the beginning, then it's easier than waiting until the end. It's much easier. Let's go to uh, 16. Now, about the collection for the Lord's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. And let me just say what, what Paul is doing here. It's pretty clever, but he does it in a godly way. He is telling the, uh, the Corinthians that, um, that the Galatians are really doing a great job with giving. And he's telling the Galatians that the Corinthians always do a really great job with giving. So he's encouraging the Galatians to give by using the Corinthians as an example. And he's encouraging the Corinthians to give by using the Galatians as an example. So that's just a little backstory on what's going on here. So this is, um, this is how he begins. Uh, now about the collection for the Lord's people. Do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, the first day, that's today, that's Sunday. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income. Save it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. It's that principle again. He's saying, don't wait till the last minute. Don't wait till the end. Do it at the beginning. Be ready now. And if you read this whole passage here, you can go and read it. Um, you'll see all of the things that he says. Uh, he talks about how important it is to be ready and to prepare in advance to be ready. So, first thing is, it is the first thing. And then, giving will cost you. I have always said since we began the net, I've, I've said many times that giving should cost you something. It should cost you something. And you all know that I am a huge fan of C.S. Lewis. I love C.S. Lewis. And I thought I had read everything that he had ever written. And I ran across this quote this week. And he says this very same thing so much better than I could ever say it. And this is a quote from C.S. Lewis. He says, I am afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. If our giving habits, and get this, get this now. If our giving habits do not at all pinch or hamper us, I should say that they are too small. There ought to be things, get this now, there ought to be things we want to do but cannot do because our giving expenditures exclude them. It ought to pinch you a little bit. It ought to cost you something. I love that. Um, this is 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Remember this, Paul said. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. See, there's that principle again. If you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. If you sow generously, you will also reap generously. I don't recommend what I'm about to tell you, but years ago, Lene and I um, were a part of uh, the previous church where I was on staff, and and we did an end of the year giving campaign where we uh, dug wells in Rwanda, and Lene and I felt so strongly about this. We wanted to donate a full well. We wanted to. While the, the opportunity was there, while we were doing this project, we wanted to donate a well because it, one well would save the lives of so many people. I forget how many people it was. And, and, and clean drinking water, it just it does so much for the community. And, and it, would, it was going to save so many lives. It was going to keep so many people from becoming ill and, and it was just a great thing, and we were so excited about it, and we wanted to donate a well. And we didn't have all the money that we needed to spare to donate a full well. So uh, I went to the bank, and I 
took out a loan and we donated a full well. I don't recommend that. That's not, I'm not putting that out there as a principle. I'm just saying that that's what, that's what we did. And, uh, and then our small group said, hey, let's donate a well. So then we had to, then we had to give again <laughs> to, toward, the, uh, to, toward another well. Um, but God so richly, supernaturally blessed us after we did that. And we were so glad that we had sowed, not sparingly, but we had sown generously. And so we were reaping generously. And then uh, 7 says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I love that Paul put this verse in there because in the Old Testament, it was 10%. That was it. 10%. That's it. No, no more, no less. 10%. That was the obligation. And in the New Testament, God owns it all, as we talked about before. Um, but I love the fact that he is saying, don't give it reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So he's making, what he's really doing is making a concession for people who can't afford it. I mean, if, if giving 10% is going to keep you from being able to live, to be able to, to, to eat or to meet your, uh, n- your natural financial obligations, then he's saying here, decide what you're going to give. Decide in your heart what feels good or what seems right to you to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. He wants you to give it not because you are compelled to, not because there's a law that says you have to give this much. He wants you to give it and be thankful and generous and feel good not being under compulsion. I love that the New Testament is is flexible and the New Covenant is full of love and grace. Do you get that? Isn't that a beautiful thing that the New Covenant is full of God's love and His grace and His his, uh, understanding? And God is able to bless you Here's that first principle again. It's like, give, and then this is what happens. God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, all things, all to, at all times, all times, having all that you need, having everything you need, you will be able to abound in every good work. You will abound in every good work. So give, give what you Decide in your heart is the thing that God wants you to give. For some, for some of us, it will be more than 10%. For some of us, it will be much more than 10%. For some of us, it will be less than 10%. But go to God and decide what that thing is that you have determined to give and then give it so that God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will be able. You will abound in every good work. God wants to free us to abound in every good work. And then this is Jesus, Sermon on the Mount, one of my favorite places to go in the Bible. He says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Don't let that be your main thing. Don't let that be your main thing. But store up for, your treasure, for yourselves treasures in heaven. Let that be your main focus. Let that be your main focus. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. And then he says this most profound thing. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Sometimes someone will ask me, they will say, um, I, don't, I don't 
feel like I'm as close to God as maybe I used to be. Or some people might say, I don't feel close to God at all. And, and the first thing I say is, well, you don't go by your feelings. You're not led by your feelings. You're led by the Spirit of God. So I wouldn't worry too much about how you feel. But if, if they press it and they want to know, why, why is it that I don't feel close to God? I'll often go to this very scripture. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Um, if, if you are not putting your, your money, a portion of your money, a portion of your time, a portion of your energy, a portion of yourself, if you are not putting that into God's kingdom work, then your heart is going to be wherever you are putting that stuff. If you're focusing everything in your life in one direction, I guarantee you that's where your heart is going to be. If it's a, if it's a hobby, if it's a habit, if it's a, um, a certain group of people, or if it's a, a, you know, something that you participate in or do that is just your whole life, uh, I guarantee you that's where your heart is going to be. So even if you don't feel it, and even if you don't have a desire, the answer to that is to make a shift in your life. And consciously decide, I want to feel close to God. I want to be close to God. I want to be right with God in a way that I feel that closeness with Him. And, and you just make a decision. I want to be closer to God. I want my heart to be like, like the Scripture says about David, that his heart was a heart that was after God. God. And if you want that, really, it's a, just a conscious decision to make a shift and decide, hey, I'm going to give a portion of what I own, a portion of my time. I'm going to give a portion of my energy. I'm going to give a portion of myself, whatever that requires, to God. And wherever your treasure is, wherever your treasure is, and your treasure is your money, it is your time, it is your effort, it is your energy, it is your, your, your thoughts and your heart toward things. That's your treasure. And wherever that is, that's where your heart is going to be. That's when, when you begin to invest in the kingdom a beautiful thing happens. You begin to care and you begin to love people. And you begin to, to be loved and feel the love of other people and the acceptance and the gratitude. And, the, and you begin to become more generous. And it's a beautiful cycle that happens whenever we dis make a conscious decision to get involved with God's kingdom. The next thing is it's just between you and God. It's just between you and God. He says, this is Jesus, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. He's saying, don't get your reward now. Get your reward. Not, don't get your reward now from people, but get your reward from God. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. To be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. So Jesus is warning us, don't, don't do that. Don't receive um, your reward from others with a pat on the back and a congratulations and um, a reputation for giving and that, that kind of thing. Let it be between you and God. And this principle is not just with money, but it's with obedience in many areas of your life. Um, one of the things I discovered years ago is that if, if I did something that I felt like God wanted me to do, if, if I helped someone or if I gave uh, a portion of money or if... Um, you know, I just did something that 
God was impressing me to do. If I could do it without anyone finding out about it, there was something. And, and I don't know if this happens with you. I suspect that it happens with everybody. But if I could do that without anyone finding out, and it was just between me and God. If it was just between me and God, there was something special that happened in my heart. There was a closeness that I had with God because it was just between us. No one else knew. It was just me and God. And whenever I was able to do that, it, it seemed to enhance my relationship with God. I felt his approval. I felt his favor whenever I could do something, anything, that was just between me and God. And so I would encourage you to look for opportunities, whether it's money or anything else. Look for opportunities. Look for opportunities to do things for the kingdom that are just between you and God. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And some translations say will reward you openly. So you see what he's saying. If you give to the needy, don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, don't receive a pat on the back from others and don't pat yourself on the back. You know what I mean? Don't don't feel so good about yourself because you have done something really great. Don't major on that. Understand, whenever you do something in obedience to God, understand that he gave his life on the cross for you. And that we could never repay salvation. We can never do that. That he loved us before we ever even knew him. The next thing is that giving is worship. Giving is worship. Um, so I'm back up here before COVID. Uh, we passed the bucket every week. You remember the bucket? Julie, you got the, those buckets back there? So, uh, we passed the bucket, and it's, it's got our name on it, the Net Church on there. You can, you can just go ahead and bring it up here if you want to. Um, and this is the way we collected our offering. And, but, but a lot of people gave online, and, and that was great. And a lot of people automated their giving. But we passed these buckets. And... Uh, if you want to know, if you want to know the best way to give, I would say automate your giving. You can do that in several ways. You can set it up online with us uh, that it automatically comes out. You can uh, do it through your bank. A lot of people do that. It comes in through the mailbox. Um, automating your giving is, um, is the best way because it's something that we know that we can count on um, and you know, it's just, it just, for the leadership here, it's just, um, it's just our, pref- it's just our preferred method because we know that, uh, that we can count on that. It's consistent. Um, but whether you give online, whether you have automated your, your giving through the bank, no matter how you choose to give, it really, it really doesn't matter uh, we need to celebrate giving as worship in this church again. We used to do that every Sunday uh, before COVID, and we would pass these buckets. And, uh, and then after COVID, nobody wanted to touch the bucket, you know. So we stopped. We couldn't pass the bucket anymore. And so we, di- we didn't pass the bucket anymore. And then after we came back after COVID, uh, um, you know, I kept asking our team, hey, should we bring back the buckets? And everybody said, no, no, we shouldn't, we shouldn't do that. And so what happened was that I began to forget about 
giving. Just totally forget about it. And Lene, during the announcements, she just totally would forget about even saying anything about the offering. Like, she, one of the things that she would say is, hey, we have the blue box back there, and the blue box is still back there. You can put your offering in the blue box if you want to. Um, or you can give online. Uh, we have an app, or you can go to the website, thenet.org, and you can just hit giving right there. You can give that way. Um, it really doesn't matter how you give, but we need to have a time during the service when we celebrate giving as worship, because it is. It is one of the ways that we love God. And so today, we're doing this series, and today, the buckets are coming back. The buckets are coming back, and... Um, and we are going to make a point to celebrate giving in our church again. And even if I forget, you'll be reminded because the bucket will come by your, your row. Um, here's the scripture out of First Chronicles. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of of holiness. So giving is to be celebrated. It is part of our worship and it is part of our holiness. It's part of our holiness. So what do we have? What do we have? Let's do a recap. Make giving the first thing. It's the first and the best. Make sure that it costs you something. Make sure that it's just between you and God, if you can possibly do it that way. Make sure it's between you and God, if you can. And make sure it is part of your worship. Whether you do this, whether you do this on Sunday or not, it doesn't matter. You can do it on Sunday. 70, I think I read this this week, 73% of all giving happens during the week. Happens during one of, during the weekdays, between Sundays. So, make it the first thing if you can. Make sure it costs you something. Make sure it's just between you and God, and make sure it's part of your worship. I hope that this was uh, not unbearable for you to talk about money. You know, people don't like to talk about money uh, in church and. Um, and I have to admit, it's not my favorite thing either. But God loves a cheerful giver. 